Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Sidlaskis, and I'm coming to you from uh, Oregon State University in the United States to uh, give, a, give a talk entitled New Phylogenetic and Phylogenomic Insights about the Diversification of Carassiform Fishes. Uh, I've been studying the radiation of this amazing group of fishes uh, for most of my professional career, and I'm very excited to have a chance today to speak with you about uh, several really interesting new uh, studies that have um, very much given us a great deal of new insight to the overall evolutionary radiation and the history of diversification of these marvelous fishes. And I'm going to talk about two of those projects in particular over the course of our time together. Let me first introduce you to Carassiformes. Carassiformes is truly one of the world's greatest radiations of freshwater fishes. It's more than 2,000 species. It's at about 2,300 uh, the last time that we counted, um, with just enormous ecomorphological diversity. Uh, all of the fishes that you see here are traditionally placed in Carassiformes, um, with the uh, ones on the left being uh, all neotropical. Examples, those are species that occur on South America. And then the four on the bottom being representatives of the four families that occur in Africa. And so this radiation uh, is widespread on uh, both Africa and on the Neotropics, but it is particularly diverse within, within the Neotropics, where Carassiformes, and in particular one of its suborders, Caracoidei, uh, forms one of the, uh, the biggest components of the Neotropical ichthyofauna, which is itself uh, the greatest freshwater ich ichthyofauna, the great greatest freshwater diversity of fishes that exist anywhere, anywhere on the planet. And as I think you'll see from uh, all the different body shapes that are illustrated here, uh, Carassiforms have figured out how to inhabit and exist as just about any type of uh, life history or niche that fishes do. They range from the longest snaggletooth predators to very small bodied insectivores, uh, herbivores, both large and small, deep bodies, thin bodies, top of the water column, bottom of the water column, you name it, there's a Carassiform fish that has probably invaded and occupied that ecological niche. So it's a wonderful group of fishes. Uh, they are divided into two suborders. This will become important a bit later in the talk. One of them is Caracoidei, which is where the bulk of the diversity is. It's about 2000 species in South and Central America, and then another 120 or so in Africa. And those are the ones that I've outlined in the green color here. We've also got a much smaller radiation called Cytherinoidei, which is about 120 African species. <coughs> and traditionally, um, Carassiformes have been divided among these two suborders, again, with most of the diversity in Caracoidei, which is the suborder that spans both of the continental radiations. When we look at this kind of exuberant diversity, um, the immediate evolutionary questions are just how and why did this particular group of fishes diversify so greatly? And we might ask some more specific questions, such as is the diversification primarily ancient or recent? What drove all of this change? Why is there so much speciation? What caused the ecomorphological divergence? And then ultimately, so the million dollar question is just why are there so many neotropical species? And what was different about the portions of this radiation that unfolded in, uh, in South America versus in Africa? Um, so these are some of the questions that I hope that we'll have a chance to answer at least partially as I proceed through this talk. In order to understand diversification, I'll argue that we absolutely do need to understand genetics. And I think that's part of why I was invited to, uh, to speak to you today. Um, and in particular, we need to know about phylogeny and species boundaries. We're sort of doing population genetics and species level genetics tells us what all the leaves on the tree of life are. And then the phylogeny will tell us about how all those leaves fit together on the tree of life. What is the pattern of descent? What are the evolutionary relationships among those species? And all of that is very important in order to understand diversification. But to get a complete picture, we also need to know about all the other aspects of biology. Uh, anatomy is a big part of this. We need to know about shape and size of the organisms, their osteology, which means their skeleton structure, their development. How do they grow up from small to large? And what's the functional uh, difference between the, the morphologies that we see in the different species? We also need to know an awful lot about ecology. What do they all eat and where do they live? You know, what's their niche in terms of their trophic, trophic diet, their trophic niche and their habitat? Trying to understand these things will tell, an, uh, tell us an awful lot about how and why they 
turned into so many different variations on a theme. And to form links among all of these, we need a class of methods called phylogenetic comparative methods that essentially link the anatomy and the ecology to the phylogeny. And you'll see a number of examples of phylogenetic comparative methods as I proceed through this talk. I'm gonna to talk to you about two different papers, recent papers today. Um, the first one is this one from 2009 that was published by my former doctoral student, uh, Michael Burns in, in association with me. Um, and this is the first look that really um, puts, uh, synthesizes a lot of information about anatomy and ecology uh, with what is known about phylogeny at the time that we published this in 2019. And so our paper was titled Ancient and Contingent Body Shape Diversification and a Hyperdiverse Continental Fish Radiation. And the real central question that Mike was interested in investigating and answering during his thesis uh, was are carassiform fishes overall an, an ancient adaptive radiation? We know that the group is really old. It existed on Gondwana before the fragmentation and the sundering of that supercontinent into what we know today as Africa and South America. Um, and certainly a continental radiation is somewhat different than what we think of as classic adaptive radiations that unfold in either island systems uh, or uh, in lake systems, which are essentially watery islands. Um, among fishes, probably the, mm, uh, the most classic example would be the cichlid radiations of the African rift lakes, which are shown uh, delightfully in this image from one of uh, Muschik's papers from 2012. Um, and this one is showing the convergence in, in the wonderful radiations that occur in the three major African rift lakes. We know that, that um, Carassiformes is a continental radiation and not the sort of thing that happens, uh, that happened in the African Rift Lakes exactly. But Mike was wondering what would uh, it look like if there were a, a adaptive radiation that unfolded on a continent a long time ago and for which we have the historical um, legacy now preserved in an ancient radiation. And he predicted that if Carassiformes did go through some sort of ancient adaptive radiation, then we would see these things in their current relationships. Uh, we'd be able to reconstruct a history of a lot of shape diversification associated with early caliatogenesis in the, the family, or in the order, I should say. Um, we would see specifically linked changes in diet and morphology. And so as the animals are exploding into different niches, we would see changes not only in what they're eating or where they're swimming, but in the morphology that allows them to do so and that we would also see evidence of the convergence that's one of the, the real hallmarks of these repeated radiations that have unfolded in uh, lakes like the African Rift Lakes, but also various, various islands around the world. So these were Mike's predictions. In order to get at that, um, he did certainly phylogeny, but uh, give me a moment to tell you a little bit about the uh, osteology and the anatomy uh, and the ecology that Mike also looked like. Um, his is one of the, the first studies to really look comprehensively at the body shape diversity of the order and to um, rigorously describe how all the species differ from each other in a geometric mathematical space. And so he essentially radiographed and quantified the shape of more than 2,000 specimens representing more than 300 species from 21 Carassiform families, which is almost all of the families that exist in the, radi in the radiation. And he generated figures that look like this that basically tell us what are the major axes of morphological diversification among Carassiformes. A lot of it has to do with whether they're long and slender or uh, short and compressed fishes, but there's also quite a lot of variation in things like uh, the size and the position of the mouth, uh, where the fins are placed on the body, the size of the eye, and so on and so forth. And one of the first visual things that falls out of Mike's work is a confirmation visually and mathematically that not only does the, the neotropical New World radiation of Carassiformes have an awful lot of species, but it also has much more morphological and anatomical diversity than does the radiation of fishes on Africa. And so we have the New, New World fishes over there on the left and the African ones on the right. And <coughs> the uh, exuberance, I think, is very clear on the left and also the differences in the occupied space between the two radiations. Neotropical carassiforms have um, figured out basically how to build almost any kind of fish body that you can imagine within their radiation. They range from arrow-shaped sedgitiform predators to more fusiform streamlined forms, very deep-bodied compressiform things, 
and even very strange ones uh, like the hatchet shape of the aptly named freshwater hatchet fishes. On Africa, we still see uh, some of that diversity, but it's more muted. Uh, that radiation is sort of restricted to the center of the morphous base and doesn't include a lot of the extreme forms. In order to make sense of all that diversity, um, Mike also needed to hang that on a phylogeny. And so what you're seeing here is the first time calibrated multilocus multi, multi -locus molecular phylogeny uh, for Carassiformes. It's not the first phylogeny from the order, but it is the first one that included a time axis, which is very important for the analyses that we ended up wanting to do. And so in order to get that, we assembled and cleaned the available sequence data for Carassiformes that existed within GenBank and inferred this time tree in a software called Beast, uh, version 2.0 of Beast. And there are seven node-based fossil calibrations that are incorporated in this that give us not only the relationships among the species and the families, but also how long ago each of the splits happened. And indeed, the earliest stages of the diversification push well back into the Cretaceous prior to the separation of Africa and South America. With that together, we can also look at the evolution of diet in the order. Um, and we got this data from a comprehensive literature search of many, many dozens of papers. And we took everything that we could find about what Carassiformes eat and separated them into six broad diet classes, uh, detritivore, herbivore, insectivore, invertivore, omnivore, and piscivore. And then did a Bayesian ancestral state reconstruction using sim maps, or really a, a set of such reconstructions using sim map in order to get pictures like the one that you see on the right, which is a reconstruction of when and um, where the dietary class or the trophic niche evolved on the phylogeny. And with that all together, we can begin to ask questions about whether or not uh, diet and morphology are changing together and when in time we see a lot of those changes happening. Uh, in order to get at some of those uh, data, we did a lot of different model fitting. I'm not going to talk a huge amount about the details about how this model fitting works, uh, but what you're seeing in this model is the kind of graph that could be output by one of two programs that we used to generate a posteriori, a posteriori models of adaptive optima. And the programs were Philo EM and Surface. And what these essentially do is identify where on the phylogeny there is a major shift in the shape of the animals and sort of where it seems like the animals are sort of now gravitating towards a, a new optimal shape. And those numbered circles show where those shifts occur. Uh, these are the surface results, but the Philo EM ones look fairly similar. Um, the two major take homes here are that many and possibly most of the major shifts in body shape occurred during the first half of Carassiform evolution, sort of during the, the first 50 million years of about the 100 million years that they've been evolving. Um, and that Carassiformes overall reached much of their modern shape diversity in the Cretaceous and the early Paleogene, which means that by about 50 million years ago, Carassiformes had already expanded to include most of their modern morphous space. They had figured out all of the different ways to, to build their bodies uh, to a first approximation that we see the modern species exhibiting. After that point, it's sort of uh, variations on themes rather than inventing whole, whole new body shapes out of a new cloth. There's a couple of exceptions to that, but really the most of the diversity evolved early in the family. Um, so there is also a very clear link between shifts in body shape and diet. Uh, the figure on the left is showing where the shifts in body shape occur. The figure on the right shows where the shifts in diet occur. Um, <coughs> if you believe the surface results, whether, whether you believe the surface results or the Philo EM results, most of these shifts are falling on the same branches of the phylogeny. And so with the surface, 10 out of 17 shifts in body shape occur at the, on the same branches and at about the same time as changes in trophic ecology. Uh, with Philo EM, that identifies a few fewer shifts in body shape, but in that case, still five out of the eight of those uh, change, are changes in body shape that occur exactly at the same time that major shifts in trophic ecology occur within the order. And this is very unlikely randomly. 
Uh, the probability of that occurring randomly is about one and a quarter million using the surface results and about seven in 10,000 using the Philo EM results. And so it's a very, very small chance uh, that this is just random. Rather, it's pretty clear that whatever is driving changes in body shape is also driving changes in diet within the order or that one of the two of these is, is driving the other. Clearly, there's a, a very obvious link between morphology and ecology. So all of that is great. Uh, we also looked at convergence. Um, and this was very interesting because convergence is often a hallmark of adaptive radiations in that sort of in repeated sections of the, um, the, the radiation, different lineages keep hitting upon the, the same optimal solution to, to a particular ecology. And we only saw that for the predators, for the pisivores, the fishes that are eating other fishes. Uh, those are the red dots here in what we call a phylomorphous space, which is basically a projection of phylogeny uh, and ecology into the morphological space. The red dots are all sort of clustered in the top center. And that is telling us that there really is an optimal morphology for ambushing and chasing down other fishes. Uh, but that's not really the case for any of the other dietary classes. Herbivores, omnivores, insectivores, invertivores, they're scattered all over the morphospace. And so essentially there are many, many different ways to build a body that is very efficient and optimal, uh, or at least doing well at eating lots of different dietary, dietary things. If you want to eat, eat plants, you could be long and skinny, you can be short and compressed. Uh, it seems like there's lots of different solutions. The other possible exception to that are the detritivores, which are the purple dots, mostly in the left side of the graph. Uh, there's only a few evolutions of that particular dietary class, and so the co possible convergence there doesn't turn out to be statistically significant, uh, but it might actually be there. But overall, while we did find some convergence, we found a little bit less than we might have expected. Uh, there's a whole lot of diversity and lots of different ways to invade or to adopt uh, different trophic ecologies within Carassiformes. So with respect to Mike's question, could Carassiform fishes be an ancient adaptive radiation? We absolutely saw shape diversification associated with early cladogenesis, uh, and we also saw linked changes in diet and morphology, so those two are resounding yeses. Convergent ecomorphological evolution only sometimes, and actually a little bit less convergence than we thought we might see. Um, and all of that sort of suggests that maybe uh, there is um, some evidence that Carassiformes were an ancient adaptive radiation, but I haven't told you anything about speciation. And that's really the big missing piece of this, at least at this point. Um, when we think about classic adaptive radiations, we think about the generation of not only this ecomorphological diversity, but a whole lot of species in a very short amount of time, sort of a, an initial burst of speciation. Um, did that occur in Carassiformes? That's sort of the million dollar question that needs to be answered next. Um, and that ties directly into this question about why, there, why is there so much more neotropical diversity? Why do we get 2000 species of these, uh, these fishes all, all over the new world, whereas a we get a much more muted radiation of about 250 species on Africa? To try to figure that out, we really need to know an awful lot about what, <laughs> um, what and when, what's driving speciation in the group and when did speciation happen? Not only in, I suppose, where, <laughs> we know that there's a lot more of it in the neotropics, but how did this happen? What are the dynamics of speciation in the group? This really comes down to a set of classic questions about tropical diversity. Are the tropics a cradle of diversity or are they a museum of diversity? And so I'm illustrating those two concepts with these two images. The one on the left is a picture of my daughter, Fiona, when uh, she was just an infant. She's a little bit older now, uh, but there she is in her cradle. There is a <laughs> cradle of diversity there, I suppose. And on the, the right, I'm showing a, a wonderful image of the collections at the Museums for Naturkunde in Berlin. Is that what's going on? Are they the, are the tropics a museum of diversity? And what do I mean by these two metaphors? Well, I essentially mean this. Is the exceptional species richness of neotropical Carassiformes recent or is it ancient? By cradle, uh, we would mean that many phylogenetic lineages would have very recent origins. And so the tropics would be a showcase of diversity that has accumulated uh, within bursts of speciation fairly close to the present. And if that's the case, 
we would expect to see over time phylogeny wide acceleration in rates of diversification, or we might see recent bursts of diversification in some families, but not others. Conversely, the tropics could basically be a showcase of organisms that evolved a long time ago and just haven't gone extinct. And so the accumulation of species richness over a more extended period of time. If for Carassiformes, the tropics are a museum, that would mean that we would expect many phylogenetic lineages to have ancient origins. And that in looking across the tree of life for Carassiformes, we would expect to infer either constant rates of diversification or even decelerating rates of diversification with lots of diversification early on in the history of the tropics and then maybe more muted diversification recently. What's going on? Which, which of these models fits the Carassiform radiation better? The trick is that Mike's phylogeny, wonderful as it was, doesn't have enough species to answer this question. It's got 129 taxa in it, which is only about 5% of the, the species that actually exist in Carassiformes that we know about. And it's also based on relatively few genes. Uh, this is Sanger sequence data, and it's really just four loci that are going into uh, this inference. And so this phylogeny doesn't have the power needed to answer that question. There was another phylogeny of Carassiformes published at about the same time. And in many respects, it's a very nice study. Uh, this is the first phylogenomic study uh, that was done on Carassiformes. It's by Bettencourt et al. in the same year, 2019, uh, using an exon capture data set of about a thousand protein coding genes. And so a whole lot more data than the, the Burns and Sedlaskis phylogeny. Uh, but crucially, their study wasn't time calibrated. It didn't include a time access. And so while that tells us a great deal about the relationships among the various Carassiform families and species, it doesn't tell us about the time of divergence for all of those uh, different, different splits in the tree. And that's exactly what we need to answer this question about museums and cradles. And so this phylogeny uh, wasn't sufficient for our purposes. So we made a new one. And what I want to do is to, uh, for the remainder of our time together is to spend a lot of time talking about a very recent paper uh, that we just published in Systematic Biology. Um, and I need to stress that I am by far not the only person involved in this study. It was a labor of love over many years by lots of different people. Um, I'm just the one that happens to be talking to you today. And the lead author is Bruno Mello, uh, currently postdocing at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, and the other major players uh, in putting all this together, um, I wanted to particularly single out Tom Neer's group and Claudio Oliveira's group. Uh, Bruno was actually working with Claudio at the point that he put, the, put this together. Uh, so Tom Neer at Yale and uh, Claudio Oliveira at the State University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, they and their teams were really, really important in putting all of this together. So we made a new one. Uh, and we did it uh, using phylogenomics and in particular using ultra conserved elements, which I'll show you in a little bit more detail on the next slide. This is one of our big take homes. I realized that um, in the diagram like this, you won't be able to read the, uh, the, the words on the phylogeny, but that's a picture uh, showing uh, our view of the relationships, <coughs> our view of the relationships of Carassiformes using the best taxon sampling to date. Uh, we have 312 species in this phylogeny, which represents over 200 genera and 23 of the 24 known Carassiform families. We did lots of different types of tree inference. Uh, we did it using likelihood in Raxamel, Bayesian <coughs> approaches in Exabase, and also using species tree approaches in a program called Astral. Uh, various types of topology tests using an approach called gene genealogy interrogation, and also a program called Bucky. Uh, and then and crucially for our purposes, there's a time calibration step that occurred in BEAST2 in which we used six node-based fossil calibrations in order to put a time access on the diversification of Carassiformes, which is what we needed in order to begin to test these ideas of cradles and museums. Uh, I said that this was based on ultra-conserved elements. What's an ultra-conserved element? Uh, well, essentially these are portions of the genome that seem to evolve very slowly when we compare among species. And in particular, we're looking at a new probe set for these that was designed by Brent Fairclough, specifically for work on Asteriophysum fishes. 
And so you look across the genomes of uh, <coughs> many different types of fishes in Asteria physi and find the sections of the genome that don't evolve very much among just and, and are similar in distantly related species. And you can use those to design a probe set that binds to those particular loci and then sequence away from them. And in so doing, you end up integrating across fast and slow evolving regions of the genome. Uh, regions of the genome very close to the center of the loci evolve slowly and are informative about divergences deep in, in the phylogeny. And the further away you get, the faster the rate of evolution get, and you get variation that's more informative about tipward diversification. Uh, so it's a very nice way of getting lots of different types of evolutionary rates in the same, the same matrix. We had success in capturing about uh, 1,300 ultra-conserved element loci. That's more than 300,000 base pairs. And like I said, we got informative variation throughout the depth of the phylogeny. To that, we applied several different types of diversification rate analyses. And the two that uh, I'll show you today and that we emphasized in the paper are programs called BAM and TESS. Uh, BAM is a program by Dan Rabowski and his team as a Bayesian approach that identifies lineage specific shifts in diversification rates. <laughs> so in particular, it looks at the, the rate of diversification, where diversification is speciation minus extinction, and infers that for each branch of the phylogeny, whereas, whereas Tess, uh, Hona et al., 2015, is a Bayesian approach that uses the comet model to identify episodic phylogeny-wide shifts in diversification rates. And so TESS is essentially looking at slices of time and saying, what do we think the rates of diversification are 100 million years ago, 90 million years ago, 50 million years ago, 10 million years ago, whereas BAM is looking at, lineage, at specific lineages or branches in the phylogeny and inferring speciation rates there. But they're both important and they're both ways of getting at this cradle and museum question. <coughs> This is the key takeaway <clears throat> figure from our paper. Um, there's a lot going on here. So essentially I'll uh, break it down and look at each section independently. But on the left, we have the overall phylogeny for the order uh, in which the purple bar indicates the period of Gondwanan breakup. The top right are the results from BAM that are showing the lineage specific diversification rates where the red sections are sort of fast speciation, fast diversification, blue is slower rates. And then on the bottom right are the results from tests, and those are the phylogeny-wide diversification rates. And so how fast do we think diversification is proceeding at each slice in time? Major topological conclusions, just about the, the, the structure of the tree, um, as was previously suspected and uh, found in several other studies, it's very clear that both suborders within Carasiformes, Scytherinoidei, and Caracoidei began to diversify prior to the breakup of Gondwana. And indeed, there are at least seven lineages present by the final separation of the continents. Uh, in, in terms of the relationships among the families uh, within both suborders, we get very close agreement with what Burns and Sedlaskis did in 2019, as did the phylogenomic study by Bettencourt et al. But interestingly, and different from both of those studies, we recover a non-monophyletic Carassiformes. Huh? Well, well, what do you mean? So graphically, this is what I mean. We get a result in which Celeriformes, the global radiation of catfishes, uh, another one of the most hyperdiverse groups of fishes on the planet, seems to be inserted in between Scytherinoidei and Caracoidei, which would make Carassiformes paraphyletic. It basically says that Celeriformes turns out to be the sister group to Caracoidei and not Scytherinoidei, as has been previously suspected and widely held for several decades at least. Um, and that was a very interesting result. And it's not the result that Betten Kerr at all Bet and Kerr are at all got in 2019, they recovered a much more um, traditional arrangement of these, these fishes in which Scytherinoidei and Caracoidei were sister to each other, Celeriformes outside of that, and therefore this would be a monophyletic Carassiformes, and again, they stress that result in the, the title of their paper. So what's going on here? Why is there a discordance here? 
a large part of the problem is that there aren't very many loci, even in a big phylogenetic data set, phylogenomic data set, that contain information that's informative about the most ancient splits in the phylogeny. In, in particular, it turns out that this very weak signal in Betancur Aradal's data set, that deep, um, after correcting for uh, a software bug that uh, was unfortunately there in their original paper, uh, Simeon et al. 2020 found that only two of the more than, the more than a thousand loci uh, in that data set actually have sufficient signal to discriminate hypotheses at the deepest nodes. So that particular exon capture data set doesn't really have very much power or a whole lot of information to figure out what's happening uh, in these very early splits in the phylogeny. And for our part, we think that we've got better power. Uh, a program called Bucky applied to our UCE data set reveals that we actually have 49 ultra-conserved element loci that support carassiform paraphyly versus only 14 loci that support carassiform monophyly. And so there's actually some support for both patterns in our data set, um, but there's more support for paraphyly. It's still important to, to note that uh, more than 12, uh, more than 1,200 of the loci in our data set also don't speak to these uh, divergences at the deepest levels of the tree. So this phenomenon in which most of the loci don't speak to early divergence is true of both of these phylogenomic data sets. But we still have a lot more loci that are informative about these ancient, ancient divergences. And so we argue that carassiform paraphyly appears to be the best supported molecular result. And we're now also not the only study that has gotten it. Uh, but this, we have certainly got the most taxon rich study that has obtained this result. So the molecules at this point seem to be pointing to carassiform paraphyly. That said, it is quite important to note that the morphology still needs another look. Um, if you go back to the classic study of Think and Think in 1981, and then again in 1996, uh, they identified seven putative osteological synapomorphies, which basically means aspects of skeletal morphology that would link caracoidei and cytherinoidei within a monophyletic carassiformes. And this has never really been challenged. Uh, the morphological signal that we know about to date suggests that carassiformes really should go together. It's a landmark study. Uh, but it's also important to know that it's got fairly sparse taxon sampling, just a few dozen species involved, um, and no explicit tree searching algorithm. It's also worth noting that at least two of the seven characteristics here are homoplastic, meaning that they're known to exhibit at least some reversal or convergence. So we really need to go back to the anatomy. It's not just a, a story about genetics, so the genetics are pointing pretty strongly towards carassiform paraphyly. We wanna go back to the anatomy and the osteology and sort of re-examine these characteristics and see what we might learn by re-examining those, those characteristics. Hasn't happened yet, uh, but this is something that's very much on our radar for what we want to do next. But to, for, to wrap up the talk, let me go back this, to this idea about cradles and museums, because testing this was really one of the, the big reasons that we wanted to build this phylogeny. Does the exceptional richness of carassiform fishes result from uh, recent diversification in a cradle of biodiversity or the accumulation of species over a very long time in a museum of diversity? These are the test comet results that are looking at phylogeny-wide rates of diversification, and they speak pretty strongly to that answer. Um, what you can see in that uh, the speciation rate, is on, inferred speciation rate is on the top, extinction rate in the middle, and the overall net diversification on the bottom. And what we're highlighting with that vertical gray bar is that test comet infers a pretty marked episode of accelerated diversification just 30 million years ago, which is well after the, uh, well after the, the origins of Carassiformes in the early Cretaceous. And so that alone is suggesting that a lot of the diversity in the order is actually a fairly recent phenomenon. BAM essentially agrees, uh, but refines that result to suggest that the pattern is actually being driven by just three families. And so these are the ones that appear in the, the, the warmer colors, the red on the figure there on the left, the BAM analysis suggests that three families, Anastomidae, Caracidae, and Cerasalmidae, began rapidly speciating on South America 30 million years ago, 
So these are all neotropical lineages. They're not African ones. And they're the ones being picked out as having really exceptional diversification rates. Huh, really interesting. What was happening in, <laughs> in the neotropics 30 million years ago? Well, it turns out an awful lot. If we go to this classic paper by Horn et al, 2010 in Science, we can see that 30 million years ago is about when we see the earliest stages of Andean orogeny, meaning the uplift of, of the Andes in Western South America, in the beginning of massive restructuring of the hydrology and the geology of the entire continent. There's the formation early on of the vast sub-Andean river system, which eventually turns into a, a marvelously complex network of wetlands and eventually a very large lake called Lago Pebas, the various rivers draining into it. Uh, and then when we go on a little bit further, as the Andes continue to uplift, eventually the, the Amazon itself changes its course from a, a northward, northward flowing system into an eastward flowing system. And throughout all of these time with these massive changes, there's lots of connection and reconnection of uh, one river system to another. And so it's not surprising at all that a period of such geographic and geological dynamism could act as a species pump. Um, so almost without question, that's part of the story about what is going on here in the neotropics. Um, and those results there together are essentially what, uh, what led us to title the paper what we did. And so the, the take home title of the recent paper is Accelerated Diversification Explains the Exceptional Species Richness of Tropical Caracoid Fishes. It seems that the geographic dynamism 30 million years ago in the Neotropics seems to have really sparked an episode of diversification among three caracoid families in particular. And that burst of diversification is responsible for an awful lot of the diversity that we see today, which would make much of the caraciform radiation a cradle of diversity. But it also raises this question. Well, what's special about just those three lineages? If it, the, <laughs> you know, all of the neotropical caracoid lineages inhabited those pan-Amazonian rivers 30 million years ago, but three seem to have gone berserk, where it leaves three diversified a whole lot faster than the rest of them. And then this immediately begs the question about what was special about early members of uh, Anastomidae, Sarasalmidae, and Caracidae. And so this is where I get into sort of the fun speculative, perhaps hand wavy section of the talk, um, but I can't leave you without at least giving you some ideas about what we think might have been happening. Let's think for a moment about factors that can accelerate speciation. Um, we know that certainly traits that limit gene flow and fragment populations can do that. And so classically, these tend to be small body size, small ranges, and restricted habitat preferences. Small endemics are much more prone to habitat, uh, to, to population level fragmentation, um, and basically allopatric speciation. So that might be part of what's going on here. We also know that strong sexual selection and the rapid evolution of mate preferences can drive a lot of divergences um, uh, among species. And so essentially speciation by sexual selection, often this uh, generates an associated divergence in signaling morphologies, such as coloration and ornamentation. And then finally, there are the classic ideas um, originally with key innovations that some clades just have an enhanced ability to respond to ecological opportunity. Um, and so anatomical key innovations can be one of those, things like the, uh, the pharyngeal jaws of cichlid fishes. Uh, but we also recognize that things like high modularity or genome duplication can basically relax constraints on diversification for particular groups and allow the, the burst of radiation that we think of as classic adaptive radiations in which you generate lots of species, lots of, uh, of body shapes, lots of, of new trophic ecologies, uh, all within a very short amount of time. And so maybe there are key innovation ideas uh, that fold into all of this. What do I think is going on in each of these three families? Well, here's Sarah Salmone. This is about 100 species of pacus and paranias uh, throughout the Neotropics. They clearly have exceptional ecomorphological variation um, and really remarkable trophic uh, diversity. Um, this single family of caraciforms includes carnivores, herbivores, omnivores, and even scale eaters and their tooth morphology is just all over the map, uh, as you can see in some of these papers being led by Matt Coleman. And so the story in Sarasalmidae 
almost certainly has to do with some intrinsic factor, uh, which could be a key innovation. It could be a pattern of modularity. It could be something about their genome. Uh, but there seems to be something about serosalamids that makes them exceptionally prone to changing, changing their diet and to diversifying their oral apparatus. Um, and so that's going to be a fantastic area for future research. Anastomidae is the family of fishes that I'm perhaps best known for studying, so I'm really interested in trying to figure out what's happening here. Um, anastomids are about 150 species of headstanders. They're primarily omnivores and herbivores, very well known for tons of osteological uh, variation, particularly in their mouth position and their dentition. But they've also got really remarkable diversity in coloration, as you can yeah, see in this um, splash of some of, the, some of the species that fit in the radiation. In a recent paper by Lefeo et al. also illustrated that they've got great developmental plasticity, which is a, a, a fabulous recent result. Um, and in particular, their oral jaw morphologies have a lot of developmental plasticity in that the same species seems to be able to develop more than one jaw shape. Also very exciting. Um, so it looks to me like there may be two different things going on here. One is a inherent propensity to change your jaw position and uh, change your dentition, maybe change uh, associated diet. But then there's also something going on with really fast changes in color pattern, which may have to do with some sort of uh, rapid evolution of mate recognition happening in the system. And so that's again a, a research program that I really want to dive into in the future try to understand what's driving the rapid evolution in anastomids. And then the most diverse of all of them are the carassids. This is 1,200 species, and so about half the overall radiation in a single family. Small size absolutely has to be part of what's going on here. Uh, so these are am among the, the smallest of all the, the carassids. There are many, many endemics, some of them only found in a, in a single river system. Um, and so this is a group that may be exceptionally prone to allopatric speciation. But then like the anastomids, they've also got remarkably variable coloration, in many cases very beautiful, stripes and spots and all sorts of different things that could be used to identify different mates. And then the dietary diversity, certainly there are many omnivores and insectivores, but this family also includes carnivores, scale eaters, and even herbivores. And so all three things may be overlapping here. We've got sort of small size, propensity for allopatric speciation, uh, clear evolution of color patterns that could be used as species recognition signals, as well as a propensity for diversifying an equimorphology. That may just be a, a perfect recipe for generating a lot of species in a short amount of time and being able to respond very quickly to the opportunity offered by all the geological dynamism happening in South America 30 million years ago. And so that too is going to be a great research program. And I need to wrap up because I'm running out of time, but let me just say, you know, what do we learn from all of these studies together? You know, what do we get by pairing this ancient and convergent body shape paper with our paper about accelerated uh, species level diversification? And the, the biggest take home I think is this, there are two distinct phases of carassiform diversification. In the earliest phases, we see the, diversif the di diversification of body shape and ecological niche without necessarily generating an alarming number of species. And what we recognize as the incredible species richness of the modern uh, Carassiformes, or at least the modern Caracoidei, that radiation that is most diverse in South America, that species level radiation is largely a more recent phenomenon in a cradle of diversity. And so there are two distinct phases to carassiform evolution. And that I think is gonna be the biggest take home so far of all of that. Let me provide you with just this slide saying what my take home messages are. In terms of the topology, probably the, the biggest result we have is that as traditionally defined, Carassiformes appears to be paraphyletic. And that really merits uh, a new anatomical investigation of what do we think about those putative synapomorphies linking caracoidei and cithrinoidei? Be a great thing to look at next. And then in terms of the evolution, in the first half of their history, caracoidei and cithrinoidei both diversified their echomorphology without speciating rapidly. This is a pattern that actually was just recently given a name in a 2021 paper by Moen et al. This appears to be an example of an adaptive non-radiation. Lots of adaptation, lots of changes in diet and shape, 
but without the burst of speciation that would characterize a true adaptive radiation. But then the story seems to have changed about 30 million years ago when accelerated species diversification uh, really took off in three particular clades. And that accelerated diversification seems to be what explains the exceptional caracoid richness of the neotropics. And now that primes the pump and sets the stage for additional investigations of the families Anastomidae, Cerasalmidae, and Carasidae. And it looks to me like one, two, or maybe all three of these may merit recognition as true adaptive radiations. And with that, I said my piece, other than to thank the fairly large number of collaborators and funders, as well as the curators and collection managers, uh, without whom any none of this would have been possible. Uh, so for the ecomorphology chapter in particular, Michael Burns, Richard Fowry, and Allison Bullock were very important to that. There's a big list of people that were involved in the phylogenomics uh, section of this talk, uh, and then more curators and collection managers than I could possibly list on a particular slide. We also thank the National Science Foundation, the Brazilian agency FAPESPE, Fulbright Brazil, Oregon State University, and the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History for funding various sections of this work. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that I haven't run too long, um, and I thank you again for the opportunity to present today.